Welcome to another tutorial video. This time around, we're going to be talking about startup valuation and answering a very common question that we've been getting over the past few years, which is how are startups worth billions of dollars and do their valuations in any way line up with the main principles behind company valuation? So here's the usual question that we get. I don't understand how tech startups can be worth billions of dollars. Many of them aren't even making money yet. How can an unprofitable company that isn't even generating revenue possibly be worth so much? Doesn't this violate all the principles of valuation? The short answer to this question is no, it actually doesn't. You just have to change your assumptions when you analyze the companies, and you can still use traditional methodologies like the discounted cash flow analysis, the DCF, but you have to look at things a bit differently. The longer answer is that even if a company isn't making money today, it's not making profits, it's not even earning revenue, it could still be worth billions if it starts making a lot of money very quickly in the near future. And I would emphasize those last two parts, a lot of money very quickly in the near future. Both of those have to be true, or as you'll see, it's going to be very, very tough to actually make the numbers work and to justify these billion dollar valuations. So for the example exercise here, I'm gonna use this company Pied Piper, which you probably know from the HBO show, Silicon Valley. I'm a huge fan of the show. And so we're gonna use the fictional company there as the example in this exercise. If you haven't watched the show before, Pied Piper is a company that has created a lossless compression app that stores files in the cloud using far less space. So they take your files, they use a compression algorithm and they get them to take up a whole lot less space and then you can access them online, sort of like what Dropbox does, except they also add this compression component to it as well. Now, their business plan is to get hundreds of millions or billions of free users, then offer paid plans and get a tiny percentage of them to upgrade. This is otherwise known as the freemium plan. We're going to assume here that they've received $100 million in funding at a billion dollar valuation, and they have no revenue yet. Most companies would not be able to get this if they have no revenue, but we're just going to go with it for now. And this makes them a so-called unicorn. In other words, a startup that is worth at least a billion dollars or more. So the question here is, is this crazy or could a rational person actually justify this type of valuation? So let's go into Excel and answer this question now and see what we come up with. Here is our DCF analysis for Pied Piper. As you can see, we are driving revenue here based on the number of app downloads they get for their compression and file storage app. We're assuming a certain number of those downloads get converted into paid users. Some percentage of paid users will drop off each year, but overall the count keeps increasing until the end of this 10 year period. And then the paid users will all pay a certain dollar amount per year, which leads to the company's revenue. As you can see, it's growing very rapidly, starting out at zero in year one and going all the way up to almost $2 billion by the end of year 10. Then we assume a margin on that. We have our taxes. We get to net operating profit after taxes. We add back our non-cash expenses, factor in working capital, and subtract capital expenditures. So the setup is very similar to a standard DCF for a company in any other industry. What's different is the numbers and some of the assumptions that we're making here. Now, as a point of comparison, if you look at a standard DCF for a mature company in another industry, I have an example here for Steel Dynamics. The basic setup is very similar, except the numbers are all completely different. For one thing, the company is starting with a certain amount of revenue already, and then they do grow the revenue over time, but it's by very small percentages, 5%, 4%, 3%, 2%. And their margin also changes a bit over time, but we're talking about relatively small changes between 5% and 7 or 8%. It's not going from negative 5,000% up to 25% as it is for Pied Piper. And then when you look at the company's unlevered free cash flow at the very end, this is fluctuating a fair amount, but overall it is growing over time. And by the end of the period, it's going up by around 2% per year. So we have very slow growth, but we do have some growth built into this forecast. And then if you go to the top and look at the assumptions for the discount rate and the terminal value, for the discount rate, we've picked 10.5%. Most 
normal mature companies are somewhere in that range of say eight to 12% for the discount rate, sometimes a bit higher, sometimes a bit lower than that, depending on the industry. And then for the terminal value, we have used a terminal multiple of 6x and a terminal long term free cash flow growth rate of around 2.7%, just under 3%. So these are the standard assumptions you see for a mature company. Now, if you compare it to the DCF that we have for Pied Piper, so first off, the revenue here, we haven't even listed the growth rate, but it's on a completely different order of magnitude than it is for Steel Dynamics. Just to illustrate, let's copy and paste in the growth rate figures here. So we have revenue growing at over a thousand percent initially, falling to only a hundred or eighty-nine percent, and then by the end of the period, it's still growing revenue at around thirty-five percent. The operating income here goes from very negative to a fair amount positive by the end, up to around the twenty-five percent margin. The assumptions for working capital and non-cash charges and capital expenditures aren't really that crazy, but this company is not really dependent on these types of assumptions anyway, so it doesn't really matter that much. And then their unlevered free cash flow is going from a very negative number and eventually turning positive and going up to a very positive number of almost 300 million by the end. And even by the end of the period, it's growing by around 37% still. So very, very different assumptions here. And then if you go up to the top, you can see just how different some of these numbers are as well. First off, our discount rate is 50% here. It's 50% because we have an incredibly aggressive forecast for the app downloads growing by hundreds of percentage points here. And even by the end, we have around 500 million downloads per year, which is very high. Keep in mind that the global population is only around 7 billion people and that only a small percentage of them actually have smartphones. So this is quite a big leap. We're also assuming that a pretty high percentage of them actually convert to being paid users, which is another big leap. We're assuming relatively few of those users actually leave and that the ones who stay end up paying around 10, 12 or $13 per year. Maybe that's reasonable in the US. It's probably not so reasonable if you look at emerging markets in other countries. The bottom line is that to reflect all these risks and uncertainties, we have a very high discount rate. You would normally never see this type of rate for any established company in any other industry. It would be odd to see something even as high as 20%, but we're using 50% here. And then the assumptions for the terminal value are also quite aggressive. We have a 100x EBITDA multiple and then a 49% terminal free cash flow growth rate. Now, this is obviously ridiculous because no company is going to grow up 49% forever, but we have it because that's the implied growth rate when we pick this multiple of 100x. And there are companies out there trading at 100x EBITDA multiples, especially when you look at the tech industry. So the bottom line is that when you put together all these assumptions and you create a DCF like this, it's not unheard of for a company that is making no money currently to be worth a billion dollars. And we have an example of how it could work right here. Typically what happens is that the sum of the present value of the company's free cash flows is zero or is a very low number. Now the company's free cash flow does turn very positive by the end, but the problem is that this is 10 years into the future. So, if you go that far out and you have a 50% discount rate, that free cash flow is going to be worth very little to us today. The present value, the terminal value is the main contributor to the company's implied equity value here. But even this is a pretty big leap because we're assuming that the company is actually going to be worth 100x EBITDA at that point, 10 years into the future. For this to work, first off, we have to assume that revenue operating income and free cash flow take years to materialize as they usually do with the startup. This is otherwise known as the hockey stick forecast. This alone presents far greater risk than what you'd see with a normal company. We also have to have a discount rate that's vastly higher to represent that risk. Opinions differ on the exact rate to use, but some people go as high as 80% if it's a company that has nothing, no product, no team, no revenue, maybe some small prototype or something like that, maybe one person working on it. And the discount rate will go lower and lower the more the company develops and starts getting revenue and real customers. And then the third difference that emerges from all this is that far more of the company's value comes from the present value of the terminal value. So if you look at it here, we have around 99% coming from that. This would be far too high for any normal company. Normally, we don't like to see over 50%, but for a tech startup like this, since it's so speculative, it is heavily based on that terminal value.
So in short, we'd say that it's not completely crazy that a tech startup with no revenue could be worth billions of dollars, or at least a billion dollars. It's just highly speculative. Because what if no one downloads the app? What if it takes two to three years longer than expected to monetize? At a 50% discount rate, those two to three years matter a whole lot. What if the conversion rate is a lot lower and only 1% of the users become paid users? What if the company can't improve its margins and so it keeps losing money and generating negative cash flow into the future? The reality is that all these problems could turn the company into the next Titanic. And so that is why you need such a high discount rate here. On startup valuation, we'd say there are a few misconceptions thinking about everything that we've just been through. The first one is this idea that the DCF doesn't work for startups. As we just saw, you could certainly apply a DCF and create a DCF model for a startup. It's just not as useful because it's so sensitive to the assumptions. A DCF is always sensitive to assumptions, even for normal companies, but it's especially sensitive here because the company doesn't have a real business yet. Another misconception is that if you use a DCF, you have to assume that the company starts generating free cash flow far into the future. But as we saw here, it's actually more important to assume that the company starts generating free cash flow very quickly. If you don't make that assumption and you only have the company generate free cash flow starting in, say, year 10, you're going to have a very difficult time ever getting anything reasonable for the implied value of the company, simply because the present value from anything out in year 10 is going to be so low, especially at a 50% discount rate. And then finally, this idea that the assumed long-term profit margins drive the valuation. The majority of the value in a DCF for a startup is going to come from the terminal value. So this statement is sort of true in that the long-term profit margins will affect the terminal value, but really most of it's going to come down to the multiple or the long-term growth rate. So the truth about startup valuation is summed up pretty well by this quote. If a company has a 1% chance of being a $100 billion company, then it's worth about a billion dollars. The quote is from Paul Buhait, the creator of Gmail, now a partner at Y Combinator. This guy knows what he's talking about when it comes to startups. So I think there's a lot of truth to this quote. So in short, how are startups worth billions of dollars? They're worth that much if they go from zero in revenue to a lot of revenue and cash flow very quickly in the near future. This type of valuation is dependent on incredibly high growth rate assumptions and a big turnaround in margins as a company goes from losing money to suddenly making a lot of money. So the discount rate has to be very high to account for this. This scenario does make sense according to valuation principles, but only if you're willing to accept a lot of risk and also only if you're relatively well diversified. If you just invest in one startup, forget it, you're going to lose all your money. So you have to have a pretty well diversified portfolio for this type of valuation and this type of strategy to ever make much sense.